Gold Beach, Nature's Wild Side. Have a board meeting at the Oregon Coast. Gold Beach. Find out more at visitgoldbeach.com. will be to evaluate the federal and state regulations to determine if a satellite hospital 
with inpatient services is even legal, and further to evaluate the network's debt capacity for such a project. And while I'm here, here respectfully to keep you informed and apprised of current district business, I would like to make the members of the public aware that Curry Health Network, doing business as Curry Health District, is a form of local government, and its own board is tasked with the fiduciary responsibility of directing the district's business. With while the district follows federal, state, and local laws, it is not governed by any other entity such as the county or the city. Therefore, for the public to have their voices heard by the appropriate governing body, if you or others have questions about these topics or others, please address them directly with the Curry Health Network Board of Directors at a subsequent board meeting. Thank you. Uh, Council, do you have any questions that you would like to ask of? Uh, Um, <laughs> I read a lot on social media and there's a lot going on and that's one of the reasons I ask that you would come um, because um, I like to try to calm people down if I can. Is there anything that we can do, do you need a letter of support or anything that we can help the district with because we've always been good neighbors and we continue to do so assuming the board agrees, the council agrees yeah. with what I just said but in historically we yeah. have. Um, so Important to note, and not part of this update, but it is public knowledge, so I'm fair game to speak about it. Um, the district has been working with a lobbyist firm um, to uh, seek legislation to allow for funding uh, from the state budget through the Committee of Ways and Means um, that would support opening the emergency room. And while I don't have the authority to come before you from the Board of Directors to ask for support, if that is something that you all feel you would like to do, that committee would be the place that it would be important for any support to come from. But again, I can't solicit that without the board's approval, and I haven't obtained that at this point in time. And I'm really not here um, on, on their behalf for, for that. More wanted to give you factual information. Um, and uh, we do have a plan, and we are working closely with Calor and other agencies so that when we get all of the information about what this means and how it will operate and when will it start, we will be informing the public and closing some of those gaps about either concerns or uh, not necessarily opinions, but questions. Um, but getting this thing open is, is a lot of work that goes into it. And we seriously have been working hard to understand the laws that govern the ambulance service, the transport service, who can pay for what, who should pay for what, uh, and it's, it's, I'd rather come out at one time with the facts and make sure that they're accurate facts um, because there is a lot of misinformation out there. I, I definitely would agree with that. Thank you. There's, um, okay, thank you. Just thought of be real quick. I was wondering, and always have, the difference between urgent and emergency care. Yeah. Could, you, could you describe that for me, please? I will to the best of my ability without the regulations in front of me. <laughs> um, an emergency room is obligated to treat any patient, regardless of their ability to pay, if they seek services within 250 yards of an emergency room. So the truth of the matter is, if you fall on a curb and you're within 250, I'm sorry, yards of an emergency room, they are obligated to treat you if you seek such treatment regardless of your ability to pay, and in fact, when you present to an emergency room, it's illegal for them to ask for any form of payment up front or about your financial situation. It's only after a medical screening exam is done and a plan of correction is in place that we can begin to work with the patient about their financial ability. In addition to these laws of what are called EMTALA, E-M-T-A-L-A, um, emergency rooms under a licensure are held to much higher standards than in urgent care. They must have certain pieces of capital equipment. They must be available 24-7, 365 days a year. And the benefit to the public is that when an individual presents to an emergency room, a definitive diagnosis can be made and a transport can occur directly from that facility. So if you have a stroke or a heart attack, if you have pneumonia or if you're a pediatric patient and, and moments are critical, in an emergency room, any emergency room across the country, they have the means to get you to a higher level of care directly from their facility. And urgent care, 
the rules are completely different. And urgent care is required, and, and I would say that Curry Medical Center's urgent care is not actually licensed as an urgent care. It's licensed as a walk-in clinic. Um, but in urgent care, truly in the strictest sense, if you were licensed to be that, you would be required to be open seven days a week. You would be required to have a physician on site during that time. Um, but the laws governing payment and uh, your ability, your, your obligation to see anybody that walks through the door, that goes completely away. And we can actually ask for payment up front and choose to not provide services because they're not bound by the laws of Impala. So there are huge differences and huge differences in the expenses to run an emergency versus an urgent care. Um, and, and, and certainly much larger expenses from running the same day clinic the way we do now. We are open six days a week and we staff that with uh, physicians assistants, not physicians. Uh, and although they are highly qualified and excellent at what they do, if you were to show up at that urgent care, they are not able to definitively direct your care to a higher level of care. They must send you to one of the two hospitals, either to the north or the south, in which case you incur another emergency room bill, an urgent care bill, emergency room bill, and now we're transporting you. And the difference of 30 minutes is the difference of lives, to be just quite frank with you. So, um, you know, there, there's a lot of arguments about we need our urgent care and an emergency room. It is not legal for us to operate an urgent care in the same location as an emergency room because of those Impala laws. Because if somebody walked in for an urgent care visit and they really had an emergency, it, it, it gets very confusing to the public as to what level of care they really need. And so um, the, I hope I answered some of your questions. But yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah, I, it, it was always the, the words urgent and emergency uh, are so, in many ways, so similar. They are. That uh, it was just rather confusing for me uh, personally. I don't know if anyone else ever thought much about it, but uh, you know, to differentiate between those two levels of care. All right, thank you, man. Councilor Brown. Uh, I guess I'm in the dark that there are concerns. In, can you speak to what they are? I, I didn't realize there was any really resistance or concerns going on. Uh, there has been, I don't necessarily want to call it resistance, but there has been public opinion uh, on, a, on a few concerns. The, the first is there is a group of constituents uh, from the South County um, that feel very strongly that before we move forward with an emergency room, the district should evaluate if in fact a freestanding hospital is more appropriate. Is, is that what's really needed versus that's what's wanted? Um, and they're, they're They've expressed concerns, and I don't want to speak on their behalf, but my understanding is they're concerned that if we opened an emergency room, that they wouldn't get any further services, even though it may be needed in the future. But the board has directed me to begin the process to understand, first, is it legal? Of course, if those gates open up, the next question would be, is it prudent? Should, should the district consider uh, splitting beds between two facilities? We're not quite there yet, but that would obviously be the next question. The second concern that I understand um, is pricing. That uh, there's a, a constituents in the Brookings area that feels by us not providing a walk-in clinic called an urgent care, but not licensed as one, um, that we're really uh, looking to charge more for the same services. It's just simply not true. The cost of running an emergency room 24/7, 365, fully staffed with physicians, nurses, therapists. It, it, there is a difference, and there's a difference in the level of care that's provided. Um, and so we're looking to mitigate that by offering these same-day appointments, meaning if you have a non-urgent situation, you're, you've got a stub toe, you've got a sore throat, you've got an earache, it's been of a short duration, and you really would like to be seen today, we will have an opportunity for people to make an appointment and be seen that day without needing to go through the emergency room, because we do not want to clog an emergency room with non-urgent emergent things as well. The third concern has just been that you're going to do away with urgent care um, and that we need urgent care and that you know we've come to depend on that urgent care. And again, that offset to that concern is that we too do not want you to experience exorbitant pricing or, or more expensive pricing for something that doesn't require an emergency room visit. So we are 
we're well aware those are really the three larger arguments that I, I'm aware of. There may be others out there. Um, if I've missed one, I apologize, but those are the big topics. I think that's what covers social media pretty well, other than people just not wanting Curry Health Network to be the provider in the Brookings market. And there's not a whole lot I can say or will say about that. <laughs> Anything at all? Can you explain the rest of the boundaries that the district are currently? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to use loose terms. I don't have a map in front of me. But my understanding is that the boundaries of the district go just north of Port Orford to just south of Pistol River and up into the Agnes. So it's a pretty large corner of, of the county. The population, or half of the population, is south of that. Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you for coming. <laughs> I appreciate it. And. Um, our staff really can't get into politics either, so if whoever's in charge of that group can contact me, I'll get with the mayor and we'll handle anything you, that that group might be. I can I, I afterwards apologize for asking you that question. Oh, that's quite that all right. I, I had a feeling that would come up, and I, <laughs> I, I practiced what I would say. <laughs> my brain gets confused, but um, I do appreciate all you're doing. Thank you.
Thank you once again. Thank you very much for having me. Mm -hmm. Yes. I apologize. If I remember the first time around in the discussion of the emergency room down there, and you've been very consistent in your answers what they were back then, the ER can hold people for up to 23 hours. Is that close to true? Uh, it's not optimal. Uh, if, you're, if you are seen in an emergency room and you need to be admitted to a facility or certainly need to be transferred to a higher level of care, we actually need to do that in less than two hours. There are uh, quality metrics that are reported to the state about the length of time until the provider initially sees you, the length of time of decision of admit, and how long did you spend that time. So if you had length of stay of 23 hours in an emergency room, you've got a tough situation. Okay. I mean, you can't move patients. Our intent would not be to hold anybody there for 23 hours. If there's a definitive need to admit a patient to wherever their destination needs, we want to get them there as soon as possible. But we know at least we'd be able to start administering blood products or uh, medications to uh, you know, stop a blood clot from compounding your stroke in a more significant area, all of which cannot be done in an urgent care and must be done under the direct supervision of a physician. So those are just some of the other questions about what can an urgent care do versus an emergency room. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. And Jeannie, thank you for oh, you're our, our dealing with our oh, yeah. scheduling staff. I appreciate your flexibility. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks. All righty. I'm going to get the folks on the call, and then Tammy, while I'm doing the screen, which I didn't meant to do that for me, um, maybe you and, and Matt can maybe talk a little bit about the conversations that you guys had while I'm doing that. Okay, and hopefully he's still going to be there.
properties and also some comments on um, the, the densities and other issues. So we looked at those um, and we went back and looked at those specific properties in the inventory. We updated those where needed. In some cases, um, it was really a matter of um, kind of a map seeming to indicate more capacity on properties than what we were showing in the inventory because we um, were showing parcels as vacant or partially vacant, but we weren't really overlaying the constrained areas on top of the parcel, so it looked like we were saying, oh, the, the whole thing vacant or partially vacant, and, that, and it has that much capacity. That wasn't really the case. Um, so um, as part of that process, we also updated our maps, um, and um, I can refer to some pages in the the packet, so if that would be helpful, I'll just go ahead and do that. Um, and I'm, I'm referring to the, the, the page numbers in red, the, the numbers of the pages in the council packet. So, um, you know, we added a map showing the residential zones that we were looking at, just to be clear that you know, we're, those were the subjects of the inventory. That's on page nine. Um, we updated the constraints maps, that's in, on page 11 of the packet. Um, and then we added a map where we overlaid the constrained areas onto the parcels that we indicated were um, vacant or partially vacant so that really only the vacant or partially vacant portions of the parcels are showing up on that map. That's um, uh, the residential development status map on page 13 of the packet. Um, and the constrained areas are shown in dark gray, so they kind of, with what's left, the green and yellow, um, the left are the areas that are actually, you know, in the inventory mm -hmm. in terms of having some capacity for additional development. Um, so those were kind of all the types of changes we made to the, to the document. We actually did this in a couple of rounds. We did one round of changes um, sent that out to Jody and um, Councilor Kaufman, and then after the comments from um, Councilor Kaufman, we did another revised draft, and that's what you got in your packets. So I don't know, Councilor Kaufman, do you have anything to, to add to that? Um, okay, I have everything up now, so um, I wasn't sure if you want to do the, the slides that you had sent, but I have everything ready now, so. Okay. The slides, um, Brandon Buckley will talk about the slides when he talks about revisions to the, um, the housing needs projection and when he talks about the um, comparison of billable land supply and projected need. So he'll look at those. I, I'm just kind of referring to the um, pages in the billable land inventory memo and maps that are in the council packet. I'm just I'm just, I assume you all have those in front of you, so I'm just trying to refer to the page numbers in there. But when Brendan talks, he'll, he would, will refer to the slides. This is Councilor Kaufman. Um, my uh, comment is a great job um, to give the council an idea. I was pretty nitpicky, like, I can't tell the difference between these two blues, can you change them? And, and they did that, so you've got more contrast in the map. And of course, I'm coming from the lens that the median age in Bird County is over 55, so um, I know that we need people to be able to see this stuff when they're ready. Um, yep. But great changes in the maps. I really think it's much easier to see um, for the rest of the council. Like they had um, Sebastian Shores is available properly. <laughs> like no, all that is all washed away. <laughs> so. <laughs> And it's actually zone commercial. Um, so anyway, um, I, I'm very impressed. I'm still a little concerned in the analysis that the densities are, we're never going to achieve those, but you may be constrained by state statute because I know they want dense. Yeah, but let me, well, I'll talk about that just for a moment. So we, we noticed your comment that particularly the, the higher density residential zones, the R3 and ultimately the we are it, by those areas get brought into the city. You noted that it's going to be difficult to achieve um, those densities, really. At, but those are your high density zones, and you, you do allow multifamily developments in those areas. I think you have some areas. Some I I saw some developments out there that 
even that, often we would sort of think of that as a density and a medium density residential zone. So for us, we, we did not feel comfortable in dropping that the same density in higher density zones below 15 units per acre just in terms of this kind of passing muster with the state um, and with being consistent with the types of development that are allowed and I think generally intended to be developed in your higher density zone. So I'm not sort of disagreeing that it might be hard to achieve those densities and I think the thing we want to talk about with you all is sort of a follow-up to this is, you know, what are some, are there some strategies the city can undertake to help get at least closer to those densities that we assume? But for, an inven for the inventory purpose, it, we really felt like we, we couldn't re reduce those densities to the extent that you suggested. Um, again, I, I understand the, the points, but um, just from a kind of state guidelines and consistency of analysis, it's, it was tough for us to do that, to make that jump. Anything further? Um, I'll just note a couple of things related to the billable land inventory in terms of how the changes we made affected the results. Um, so if you look at um, pages or page 17 in particular of the packet, um, and that, that has the sort of summary table that includes the, the density projections that I was just talking about, um, and then it also identifies the capacity of the land and the inventory in terms of housing units. So um, that reflects all the changes we made to the inventory. And it, it, you know we ended up with some fairly significant changes in capacity compared to the first draft of the inventory that we presented when we were out there last month. Um, so I'll just kind of call your attention to a couple of numbers there. Um, one, kind of the bottom right hand um, cell in that table, um, that indicates the total capacity um, of, that, of those billable areas for future development. And it assumes that over the long term that the county areas ultimately are developed at city densities. So it's about 1,135 units, um, and it's quite a bit less than what we, what we were showing in that earlier version. And, and Brendan will talk a little bit about the comparison between um, projected need and supply, but I would just note that um, there's less capacity in your kind of lower density residential zones um, where we're going to assume that single family, um, you know, detached single family homes are developed compared to the capacity in some of in the medium um, and higher density designations. So that's a kind of low capacity there, and Brendan may kind of talk about this as well. There's more capacity in terms of just number of units in the R2 and the 2R zones. So ultimately, you know, that land could serve um, as capacity for those some of those um, projected um, future single-family detached homes as well. Um, but I do want to note that there's kind of an imbalance in terms of where the capacity is. Um, I think when you hear from Brandon that sort of the, the short answer is you've got enough total capacity to meet those projected future needs, but there's, um, th there is somewhat of an imbalance between the different zoning designations. And again, that would be kind of a subject of our next steps in the process to identify measures or strategies the city can undertake to address the needs and the, that we've identified as well as the supply that we've um, estimated. So I did just want to kind of point that out. Um, and that's kind of it for me on the, on the billable end in the recovery side, unless you have uh, other questions for me. Yeah, just, um, Council, do you have any questions for me? Uh, no, we do not right now. So thank you very much. Yep, no problem. And Brandon should be also on the line. Okay. And uh, I I'll here. turn it over to Thanks. Um, Jody, do you have the, the screen set up and is it showing the go to meeting or were you just going to show the PDF of the presentation? I was just going to do the PDF. Okay. Um, now I'll try to uh, 
that, then there was words to the uh, billable lands inventory. There were a couple things that uh, I followed up on uh, that I just want to make note of. Um, and then I'm, I'll talk about the comparison of the uh, land need that we've estimated to the new billable land inventory numbers. So um, on the first slide, it says recent demographic trends. Um, all of this is the, is the same. It's just an overview of what we were talking about last time. There was kind of a question about the pace of growth and whether that seemed realistic. Um, and besides the growth numbers you see here for population and households, there was also an estimated growth in the number of housing units um, by over 400. And there were, just, uh, there were questions on how realistic that was. Um, I did go back and do the best I could to try to figure out um, what was accounted for that growth. And it looked like uh, most of it occurred between 2000 and 2010. Um, and there's been relatively slow growth since then, since the recession. Um, but uh, we didn't, I didn't see reason to change those forecasts at this point. Um, but it does indicate that there is a lot of uh, you know, more rapid growth and probably multifamily growth uh, in the earlier, uh, in the, in the box uh, rather than since the recession. Um, the, uh, we talked about that the high, there's a high vacancy rate, there's a certain uh, percentage in there of second home and vacation properties that sort of raise the vacation rate. Uh, the uh, vacancy rate. Uh, on the next slide, uh, review of housing conditions. Uh, you have kind of a high ownership rate. Uh, well, it's in, in line with the county, a little higher than statewide. And we're counting the second homes again as, as ownership homes. Um, and uh, look to some more of the uh, housing inventory stats. Those haven't changed since last time. Uh, on the next slide about projected uh, future household growth. Uh, again, there's the PSU growth number we've used. We talked about the need to, to use that number and the fact that it, uh, the projections come out that you'll add about 1,000 new residents and 500 new households over the 20-year um, period. Um, the, uh, and that does not include any group housing. So one thing that has changed is I, I spoke last time about the fact that the future um, uh, growth projection includes both a uh, both the need for new units to accommodate the actual new resident households, but there's also a allowance built in for again more um, second homes and vacation properties. If people are going to continue to buy those, then you need to account for that as part of your housing inventory and make sure you're planning for it. Um, but last time, uh, I did present uh, just the numbers for um, households that I did not include that allowance. And so last time around, I said that the projected need was a little over 300 units, when in fact, uh, the projected need is closer to 600 units. So. I realize that's a big change, and I apologize for that, but that's to include uh, the needs of new households plus uh, uh, vacancy uh, allowance built in there. Uh, on the next slide, then, you shows the breakdown of, of those 600 units, uh, how it breaks down between projected new ownership and new rental housing. Um, most of the forecasted need is, remains to be for ownership housing. Uh, again, that's, uh, that's for two reasons. One is that um, by our demographic estimates, we think that there are more households in the area that might be able to own their homes if there were properly, uh, if there were units available at the proper price point. And then also, the, again, we're counting the vacation properties as ownership housing. So it shows up there. Um, so that's uh, kind of the, the new forecast of need that 
probably the major thing that has changed in the housing needs document. So then we'll, I'll just uh, quickly compare that to the draft BLI um, uh, inventory that Matt was just talking about. On the next slide, it says uh, summary of draft BLI. Um, this is the, the summary of the inventory. Um, we, uh, in order to compare it to the housing need, I break it down into sort of single family detached or low density residential, uh, medium density land, and multi family land. And I, uh, how I went about that is described down at the bottom, but uh, basically I just broke out your, um, your residential zones in the city and in the UGB into low, medium, and multi family. And so altogether, it's 153 acres, and you see how that breaks down by the different uh, in the different categories. If you look at the next slide, um, you'll see that uh, this is a comparison of that inventory on the top line. There, you'll see where it totals 153 acres. Underneath that is uh, the estimated land need based on that. Uh, nearly 600 housing units uh, that we're projecting. Uh, that translates into an estimate of a little over, a, a need of a little over 100 acres. Uh, and you see how that's broken down by in the low, medium, and, and high density zones. And uh, so the bottom line at the bottom of that chart is, is the comparison. And what it shows is that there's still quite a bit of need for low density residential and that exceeds the amount of inventory found in the 1R zone. Um, but there is a surplus in the, in the other zones, and particularly in the R2 zone. So, um, you know, it's likely that some of that single family housing need, um, if, there's a, if there's not enough R1 zone, could be accommodated in the R2 zone. Um, these are all kind of measures of or steps we'll be talking about in the, in the next step of this process, but um, that, that's one sort of preliminary takeaway. And then on the next slide, you see the same comparison, but looking at only the inventory land in the city boundary, not the urban growth boundary. And you'll see that there's a greater deficit there in the low density and medium density categories and there's also an overall deficit if you look down at the bottom right hand corner. So basically what this is showing is that um, given your need, a lot of your inventory is actually located, uh, a lot of your billable residential land inventory is located outside of the city and in the urban growth boundary area, um, while the areas within the city itself, uh, the land inventory is getting a little more uh, constrained. So, uh, that is what I have. That's my overview, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions about that. All right. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, ma'am. I think I might have misheard you, so I think we could go over it again. Um, we have too little R1 and too much R2. Is that what you said? Um, yes. Um, and we have, yeah, so it looks like you have two, um, a deficit of R1, if you want to think in terms of, of allocating all of your sort of single family housing needs to R1, then there is not enough of it. Um, there is, uh, comparing the forecasted need for sort of medium density zones, which might hold some attached and duplex type development. Um, that uh, it exceeds the projected need. Did I answer your question? I have a question for Jody. If I remember the zoning map, a lot of the stuff that we have zoned are 3R is really treated like 1R on the ground, right? Mostly single family drawing or no problem, never should be used. So our 3R really isn't 3R, it's 1R. That guy's on wrong. Well, and, and I would say, and just, and this is just off the top of my head, that um, I 
don't know necessarily that that we need the one R because most of the development that we have is either in the two or threes. Because the one R, I mean, the two R will get you the same as what the one R does. So like, do we do we even need? I mean, I could see the where we could combine one and two R into low and medium and then just high, but we don't have most of the 3R is not being developed to multifamily standard. Um, and there's not like a lot that I can, you know, on a staff level that we can do about that. That's more of a, a, a policy decision. But if maybe it's time, if, when we're done with this, it's time to look at some changes to our zoning code as far as how we want to, what we want to allow in the residential zones. Yeah, and I would just, this is Matt, I would, I would echo that. I, I, I am guessing that you allow single family attached in your 3R, so yeah, you are seeing that kind of development in your 3R zone. Um, that's my assumption. Um, and I would also agree that, um, that you could look at kind of the combination of 1R and 2R as your kind of combined, combined to supply for a combination of single family attached housing and then some of those more kind of medium density types like duplexes, um, triplexes, um, things of that nature. But I would also say, and this kind of gets back to Jody's last comment, that um, if you have you you have enough um, R three R um, to accommodate that future need, um, but if that three R gets developed with lower density, like single family detached uses, it can pretty quickly get eaten up. And then you can potentially end up with a deficit of land for 3R type uses. Again, for a kind of what would you really expect to be higher density uses like apartments or um, townhouses or things like that. And um, once that gets eaten up, it's real hard to get it back. It's, it's harder, frankly, from a just like neighborhood sentiment perspective to upzone uh, those properties. Um, you know, if, if what you're left with is one or two or so, I, I just, I agree um, with Jody that I think we're going to want to kind of look at um, how you're treating those zones in terms of the types of development you allow in them um, to make sure that you have sort of a balanced supply of land zone to accommodate different housing types. Um, that's, that would be part of one of our next steps. And that's, that's the other thing I'd say is that kind of that is our next step is to look at, okay, what is, our analysis show what's your zoning code allow, how is it treating these different areas, and do we have any suggestions for um, thinking differently about that? Uh, yeah, thank you, Matt. Yeah, I was wondering about that myself. If we start messing around too much with the zoning code, where, you know, are we in the possibility of imbalancing the uh, uh, our land use? Um, well, yeah, I think you might have wanted to mess around with it a little bit um, to actually better balance it, but not so much that you further imbalance it or, or make the situation worse. Okay, great. Thank you. Anything further for Matt or Ren? Anything at all, Council? Um, huh? Yes. Um, I would just, you know, just to kind of follow up on my last comment, is in advance of the next um, meeting with you all, which um, uh, I think we would expect to attend in person um, next month, um, we will put together a memo that kind of summarizes some of the things we've just been talking about in terms of kind of the balance among these zones and um, what we found in terms of that comparison and any strategies we might recommend. Um, to address those issues. So that's kind of the topic of the next meeting with you all. I would appreciate that too. Uh, so thank you very much. I do believe that uh, we're going to set you guys free. And we do want to thank you so much for the time that you spent with us this evening. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And thank, thank, you, for you, your, thank you for your patience, guys. Oh, yeah, no problem. No problem. Okay, bye bye. Good night. All right, we have a public hearing. Hmm? 
Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Um, it was my understanding we're getting pretty close to approving this, but we were going to have other people involved, I thought, like the planning commission or Correct. the others. Um, when does that part happen? I would like to um, have them at the May meeting, and we don't, we're, we can adopt it whenever. Their work is going to be done in June, but that doesn't mean that we adopt whatever comes up because there are some other um, there are some other strategies that I would like to talk about, not at this particular time, but um, I know that you know because you were on the planning commission for a long time. In 97, when we annexed Hunter Creek, we've never um, converted that, that to city zoning. This would be a good opportunity to do that because we're going to be looking at looking at other things, so this would be a good opportunity to do that. Um, annexed 11th Street in the Crestwich. <laughs> so that, that there is a try. try. Yeah, this would be the time to clean it up. But but there's, you guys don't have to adopt anything in June or July. I mean, we do have more work that we're going to have to do after they're done with their work. Okay, great. Anything further? Yes, ma'am. Um, could I ask maybe to give a copy of what we have now to the planning commission? And they already have it. Oh, good. Yeah. Maybe slip one to Candy Perryman's uh, budget packet. Okay. I'd love to have her input because she was one of the strongest opponents to the last one we did. And I'm sure you remember that well. Okay. And Mr. Mayor, yes, um, for the public hearing, um, I'm going to be down there again because the CTR folks have some stuff. It's in your packet, but we also have um, some stuff that I'll have in there. And then, um, Mr. King, I just want to let you know that I know that you can't pick that up on the screen, but all of that is available on the city's website in the, in the packet. So it is available. Um, okay. So I'm going to head down there and then. Okay, as soon as you get there, we'll call them. Yeah. Can you prepare the demonstration? Yep. Yeah. Right. Okay, at this particular time, we are going into a public hearing. And that will be at uh, 7 o'clock up to 7.20 p.m. Now the public hearing is, going to, uh, is concerning the CTR, and these are the annual rate increases, and, and this is something that we go through every year, obviously being annual. And uh, But I understand you have some new information here as well, too. From what I've been able to take a look at, uh, things are about to change a bit. So with that in mind, if, if you just identify yourselves, please, and... Uh, who you're associated with and, you know, for the record. Uh, my name is Luke Pike with uh, CTR. And I'm Candy Wolf with CTR. And we are we're here today, um, like you said, about, you know, the annual um, rate, uh, rate increase, which is going to be a 2.5%. Um, but big topic um, is rural car recycling. And I, if you guys remember about a year ago, we we rolled out in the city of Brookings, and then when we were up in front of you talking to you, we, we kind of, the discussion started here, and I and it got some interest from you guys, and it's kind of been our goal for the last couple of years to get to this point, and we finally, we finally got here. Um, so we just kind of want to get in front of you and tell you what the program entails and, uh, and answer any questions that you might have as well. Um, just to start off, um, you guys, um, no, 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 you're fine, because we got to pick you up on the mic. Okay. Um, you just cue me when you need to change the slide, okay? I'm sorry. Do I just hit you? Yeah. <laughs> Give me the evil eye. You can forward it. Okay. So, you know, the question is why, why roll cards? The Curry County, um, we've had a lot of growth with our uh, recovery rates for the, for the county, but we're not quite there. We're still a little bit less, and this is one way we can kind of help get there. This this won't get us to the six percent that we need to get to our goal, but it's it's a step in the right direction. We we'll continue that growth. Um, <clears throat> the top roll call recycling has been around for in our industry probably for twenty years. A lot of residents that you guys have move into your area usually come from a place they've already they've already had this for years. Um, this is just kind of it's going to get us to where everybody else is. Um, so we're really excited about that. Um, 
the carts, we, we roll it out in the city of Brookings. It took us a little bit to work the bugs out, but overall, rolling it out to that many people, uh, we had, it, was a, it was a huge success for us. Um, and, it's, and it was a really positive experience. I mean, you get a little bit of you know, turmoil that you know, would change, and we had to work with some things. But overall, for 2,000 carts that we rolled out, um, it, was, it was pretty successful. And we had it pretty ironed out in the first few months, so we were pretty excited. Um, this is just, you know, like I said, it'll add to um, add to the success of um, our program. Adding you guys will just be a way we can increase, um, you know, all our all the recyclables from the county. Um, so some of the benefits of the car recycle program is it promotes more recycle. So we keep less out of landfills. Our landfills will, you know, be longer for longer time. Um, it's studies have shown that somebody has more space to recycle and they actually don't use that space. It's it's kind of weird. You think it's just just a bigger bigger bin. I'm going to recycle more, but it actually does happen um, for whatever reason. If you you kind of recycle to how much space that you have, and so if you can't fit it into an 18 gallon bin, you end up putting more in your trash. Um, so the great thing about this, if we give you more space. Uh, a lot of people may be able to downsize their trash cart and in the long run you actually save money by recycling more. And that's even with you know rate changes and rate increases, you actually won't can actually end up paying less. Um, the big one I think for, for the city of Gold Beach is the cleanliness. Um, you know, obviously we have a lot of wind here and our little 18 gallon bins are, are wide open to the elements. You know, every time this customer puts it out, a breeze goes by, you guys have seen it if you're on, you know, during a windy day. I mean, the stuff goes everywhere. Um, it's, a, it's a challenge for us. We, we, we try if we're around picking up what we can, but, you know, when a 30 mile an hour wind, it, it just keeps going. So um, the carts, especially, you know, we found this in Brookings, the streets were much cleaner on, on pickup day. It was a huge for the, for the city public works people. And it, was, it, was a, it was a pretty a big eye opener. Nobody thought that that would really, really happen, and it worked really good. Of course, you know, in those days where you have 60 to 70 mile hour winds, I can't solve that problem. Um, those, those will probably blow a lot of the carts over, but it will, it will help. Um, ease of use, uh, the carts design is pretty, you know, it's just like a trash cart. Um, you know, they are, they're easy to roll to the curb. Um, the one thing that we'll show a little bit later in another slide is that the space that the car takes, everybody thinks, oh, they're really big, but the surface area is the same as any, is that little 18 gallon band, so it doesn't take up a lot of your, your weight space, but it does take your height space, so um, it is something new to get used to. Um, and the big one for us is it's safer. You know, not, a lot of people don't know that our industry is the sixth highest, uh, most dangerous industry in the, in the nation. And this is one way that our drivers are out there on route are, are a little bit safer by going to this style of a pickup. Um, how the program works, all, uh, all customers receive a 64 gallon car delivered to their house. And like right now you have, you know, have uh, two bins, you know, put them out on the day that we deliver and we'll pick up one and we leave one for your glass. Glass is kept separate. Everything else will go into the recycling bin. Um, we do have a 96 gallon. If somebody wants even more space, um, just have to give us a call. We'll come on and deliver on a larger cart. Um, as I said earlier, customers may be able to downsize um, their trash service, and we'll talk a little bit more of that later on, on, on the rate difference on that. Um, the recycle now is on a weekly service. It will go to an every other week. And your glass will be picked up at the same time. There won't be any change on garbage, so that's, that's, that stays the same. Um, all customers will receive um, education material that will explain the program. We learned a lot when we rolled it out to the city of Brookings. It's good to get ahead of the game. Um, we were advertising a month or two months before getting people prepared for it. Um, it doesn't stop all the questions, but it, you know, it helps out a lot. And um, the last thing was uh, it does equate to a price increase for this program. It's a $3.75 um, 
75 cents um, a month uh, per customer. And this, this diagram, I know it's probably hard to see, but it just shows you the measurements of our cards. Um, and it's, no, it's not okay. And then Candy will talk about our outreach. So uh, we'll basically uh, basically model it off there what we did in Berkeley that was pretty successful. Um, we've already put a because the county has ex um, accepted this program, we already have a amount um, on our bills that the county will be uh, that will be rolling this out for the county um, urban growth areas. And we did put a little uh, note in there that we were presenting this to the city of Golden and the city of Port Orchard as well. So we would get um, like a, I think the next, we would get this out in the paper, of the, the one before the uh, journey. We put this out in the paper in the pilot um, when we did Brookings, um, Meet Your New, actually the first one we did was Coming Soon. We did a Coming Soon and explained the program and then uh, a few weeks later we put Meet Your New Recycling Card and this actually describes what the customer will do on the day that we're going to switch out their card. So you know, put your garbage, um, on your day of garbage, put your recycling bins out. We, that, that way we know that you're actually participating and you want a bin. We will take your extra bins, leave you one of the small totes, um, and then leave you your larger can. Um, and then we have, we actually have this little calendar and brochure that we zip tie to the, to the uh, recycling cart. And the recycling lid actually has um, embedded or um, laminated on the top of the lid. It has this chart on it as well, or some of our chart here as well. So um, it's all there for the customer um, right there, exactly what they need to put in it and how it works. Um, we also have a, I think the fact sheet, you, you can't see this, but this is just a FAQ. Okay. That what we did is a, a, a couple of weeks before we rolled out the carts, we actually, when um, our recycled uh, collector, he put this in, uh, he would empty their bin and put this in the bin for them so that they can see, um, you know, we frequently ask questions and it just goes through all the questions that we basically have received from customers. Um, and we revisited this from working and kind of updated it and anticipated all the questions that we had. So, um, we also have bill messaging, we have radio, um, so, um, and our website, so we have all, um, we're trying to use all the mediums that we can to, to um, get the message out. Customers. Is that pretty much it? That's the label that goes on the cart. Uh -huh. And then, I think that was, the, that was the brochure I just showed you. So. The, the next one is the cal on the back is the calendar. Yeah, we have the week pick up. And I think that's about, um, we, all, we do have to manage uh, contamination because there is a lot more contamination in a roll cart than in, there is in a, in a bin. Because we, at a bin, we can actually um, just take what's acceptable where we, when we have the cart, it's a little harder to manage that. But we do have cameras inside the truck. So when we get, uh, when we empty it and we find out that there's Contamination in there, we can leave them a sticker saying, "Oops, you know, this is not acceptable." And it's, it's kind of it's friendly, uh, but we will have some um, kind of escalated ones if we have problems with customers. We'll deal with that one on one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here's a great proposal. So, uh, one part of, of the program too is our small size currently is a 32 gallon for trash. If we get the carts going, or we can actually offer a 21 gallon cart. So one of the things that promotes recycle is downsizing your trash, and we realize that you can't go any further than a 32, right? So we offer a 21, you know, with this program. So you can see that you know the price of a 21 um, is is 21 dollars and 10 cents, and then you could actually save um, seven dollars a month by downsizing it. And you can see in your packets that there's a, you know, as you go down to the different sizes, there's more and more savings. So, you know, people can try a little bit harder than probably what they currently do. I mean, those people that are really diehard recyclers, it's going to be very difficult to do anymore. But those that are kind of lax and daisies, or maybe we can do a little bit more, you know, these shifts.
should be able to um, save themselves a little bit that might have even had the increase. Um, now, one of the things that we did want to say was that with the rate adjustment on our normal annual rate adjustment, that's not on top of, that, that doesn't include the $3.75. So the rate adjustment is on the, the old rate, not on the, not on the car, car proposal rate. Um,
38. Okay. Now we have some citizen requested agenda, agenda items. And the first one is uh, Wild Rivers Coast Mountain Bike Association and a request to serve alcohol in the park during the biking event. And I know that Councilor Brennan will probably have to recuse himself on this. Yes, sir. So we have. They aren't here, they just submitted a letter because I. Um, the, the written request. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. then let's go ahead. Uh, Council, do you have anything at all against that? We can get rid of this one really quick. Yeah, this does require a, a motion and vote. Right. Make nope. a motion that we approve the Wild Rivers Coast Mountain Bicycle Request for alcohol in the park. Thank you, Councilor. Is there a second to that? A second to that. All right. Thank you. Discussion? Question? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Three to Okay. Tiffany Summers and Kelsey. And, and Kelsey, I. It, it, it was Kelsey Escada, and unfortunately she couldn't be here with the schedule change, so instead I brought Samantha. Okay. And I'm going to ask real quick, um, I'm just about to run out of battery, so hold that pop for just one second. <laughs> and this has to do with the additional sign. Yes. Correct? Yes. And this is a little credit here. All right. Well, while you're changing that, I think I'm going to send a stretch for a second. Okay, and I am. We are live. All right. Short stretch. Sorry, I just have to change batteries. <laughs> All right, if you could just uh, state your name and who you're representing, please. My name is Tiffany Summers, and I'm the branch manager of Road Credit Union here in town. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pass this around real quick if there's enough for everyone. This is just a picture of the digital sign one in place currently that, uh, as an example. Um, I'm here to ask the city for a waiver to the existing sign ordinance, and I think it's specifically if I'm correct, section 4.330 regarding the flashing um, changing video signs. Um, our object objective in this is to provide bless you, community events, uh, to promote community events um, within the area. Um, for example, we can promote things such as the Curry County Fair Parade, um, the Party of the Park, which is put on by Rotary as well as a lot of nonprofits in town, um, the High on Health through uh, the Curry Health District is part of that also. Um, in addition to some of the events in our county, the Zellia Parade, um, American Music Festival also. Uh, there is a benefit to the business about it. It would help us in communicate messages to our members as well as the community. Um, it's a much more cost-effective way than multiple mailings throughout the month. Um, some of the safety standards, uh, they don't have quick moving text. It's not overly flashy or distracting images. We are very careful when we do create these signs. Um, uh, the road is, as most of you know, very involved in the community throughout different events and try to find ways that we can be partners with our nonprofits and other organizations in town. I'm just here to ask if this is a possible chance for the committee to have a discussion about this opportunity. All right, thank you. Well, we have, of course, gone into this particular thing mm -hmm. uh, in the past. Correct. And we did have a counselor uh, at one time, uh, Counselor Brand, who was very much for this type of sign. And, uh, and I, honestly, I cannot remember how we what we uh, came up with, other than we do have our ordinance that prevents it. But uh, I thought that we were at one time, you know, Councilor Brennan, do you remember Councilor Coffin? Do you remember our discussions on that? We discussed that we would eventually try to change the sign code and discuss it then. And we never picked up the sign code again because it's too complicated. The copy I got was very involved and 
You want to see what the And um, some of the information that I have, it says that the sign code has prohibited electronic reader boards and similar blinking signs since 1989. Um, you know, it's almost as old as I am. It's just, I, I think it's a great time to revisit this and, you know, help propel our community to the, the next steps. Is this an option of us being able to, I should ask you for a waiver to what we currently have in this lesson and then do we have to raise your ordinance? The resolutions we have uh, or ordinances, council has the authority to uh, make ordinances. The staff does not, council. Once again, yes, Councilor Brown. He is in the first. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilor. Thanks. Councilor Brown. Um, I would just say that the city administrator did some research on this. Uh, you know, Medford is, has an issue with, originally they had signs that were exploding and flickering in the middle of this building. And at this point, they're trying to change that or they have changed it. Um, the reader board, my only comment would be reader boards. I can see that, but. The animated ones, I can't. I don't get both. And we did have one problem, well, not a problem as such, but uh, you know, it's not as if we didn't have a precedence because the school basically had a reader board for I don't know how long as well, too. And if I'm not mistaken, didn't um, the realty? Really had a, Simper 21 had a small one that I believe yeah, was, it is a time and temperature. Time, yeah, which yeah. that one is. Time and temperature is specifically um, exempted. And the high school one, um, that was before my time. And we actually, when this first came up several years ago, I actually tried to do research on that sign. I honestly don't know what the history is of why or how the high school was allowed to, because there isn't any sign permit, there isn't anything that I was able to find. Um, I didn't find any like council action, I didn't find any sign permit on it. So I don't. I can't speak to that, so I don't know. Okay. Um, in the code, <clears throat> and I'm just going to just throw this out there. Okay, in the code, there are provisions for variance, but I don't think that that what this is could could meet the the provisions of a variance. Now, I think that, and I would want to verify this with our attorney. I know that we've had other times where we have. Um, and specifically, this was for the UGB requirement for the Planning Commission, where the council adopted by resolution that they agreed to supersede one section of the code to allow for two members to live in the UGB. And that was by adopted by resolution. I would think that if the council wanted to entertain um, a specific instance for this reader board that we could come up with um, some conditions and we, and we could discuss those. We could talk, come up with some conditions and you could do a similar thing that the council by resolution is going to allow a particular business to have this type of sign um, under the following conditions. And then that way it's not um, it's not opening the door, so to speak, but it's also where you don't have, we don't have to reinvent the wheel and readopt the ordinance and, and. And maybe that's really what we're asking for. So by no means we want to have you guys review that ordinance, although it might be. Yeah, it would probably yes, but. Um, <laughs> to get the exception for this, you know, we, we strive to involve the community and it's just one fantastic way for us to, to get the word out on the things that are happening around and that maybe most of our community members aren't aware of. And maybe they come in or drive by or see a party in the park or something along those lines that's taking place. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, it, it sounds like we might be heading to the attorney with this question. And because this is for one specific business and it happens to be a member-owned business, do council members that are members of the credit union have to introduce themselves or just mention that they may have potential conflict? I want to say that because both of the judges, one of them will not join the credit union or they can't see any cases. 
they create new ones for it. So it does affect the judicial system, so it doesn't affect this. Oh, okay. I don't think so, but okay. I will ask the attorney that it question. Was, <laughs> well, the whole, whole sign on this would be different. It was just for this one in the well, and I would say um, that the actual or potential conflict of interest as it relates to the Oregon Government Ethics Commission, you guys don't have any um, actual or potential. It's like the credit union isn't going to pay you or give you a higher interest rate, or you're not going to get, it's not, it's the but for. The, mm -hmm. you're, you're not going to get anything, but I will verify that with the attorney just to make sure. But I don't believe so because when I've talked to them about other ethics things, if it applies to a broad group of people, which membership in the credit union does apply to mm -hmm. a broad group of people, then typically those um, but-fors don't apply. But I will verify that. Okay, so then, uh, go ahead, Kelly. Is this something that we would want to maybe get together with Tiffany, come up with a plan, bring it back to the board with certain specifics that she could present type thing and say, you know, put it in that one? I would say um, if, if, you, if you want to direct staff to pursue this, I would say uh, let me sit down with Ms. Summers and then we can talk about, you know, what the size of the sign is, whatever. And then I would say, um, in that meantime, I'll be talking to the attorney too, but I, my suggestion just off the top of my head would be um, limitation on the size, you know, like we have, we have a, this isn't, you know, an unusually large sign, you know, we don't, we don't want something like, you know, I mean, currently it's, it's already there. We right. We post banners. In a hole. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so we would say the, the reader board is limited to the following dimensions. Um, it, uh, you know, and then we would talk about the, the exploding thing that could be that. Um, and I don't know, and I'm just going to throw this out there to you, council members, if you want to say, okay, you know, 25% of this time of the sign needs to be devoted to public information things. I don't know if that's something that you want to put there. I mean, obviously, they're a business, so they want to advertise their business, but since you are providing them with an exception to the code, do you want to say, okay, 25% of the time it needs to have messages related to our community? I don't know. And I can also time. check with our marketing department, really, who puts the work in behind the, the digital sign to yeah. see if that's a feasible option. Yeah, I so, and so forth. Yeah. Well, why don't we just go ahead and direct uh, and the then for May, look into it and give us a report on that back. In May. And then in May, in right. May, I could have something yeah. back. We, uh, Ms. Summers and I can talk. I have time to talk to the attorney. And then if, um, and I'll answer the question that Councillor Kaufman had. And then if it looks like it's something that we can do, we can have a resolution ready for the next meeting. Yeah. So does that does that yeah. work? Thank you. I can get work on the dimensions and so forth too. Did you have what okay. specifications are to it? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Just wanted to confirm I couldn't be any bottom line. Did you ever raise up here with that? Or as I know. Okay, so just to clarify, um, I'm going to talk to the attorney about um, our ability to do this exception, and I will remind him about the one that we did with the planning commission. Um, concerned about membership in the credit union. Is there anything else that you want me to ask the attorney? And if you think of it later, shoot me. One exception would be, everybody's ended the same exception, we just make one of this. Um, okay, yeah. You take one at a time. Okay. And then I would say also, um, and I know we've talked about this a couple of different times, that yes, as, as Ms. Summers pointed out, I mean, times are changing, and we need to kind of come up with the times. And, um, I'm not a big fan of, of the electronic signs. The small ones are tasteful, but um, I don't. I would hate to see Gold Beach become Las Vegas. So I think that there is room in our code to allow for reader boards or digital signs of, of a small nature, not billboard size. Right. Yeah. 
there are different areas that you can go into, different degrees that you can like this thing. Yes, ma'am. The cities that do, that have like recently updated their codes, they have a provision in there that there has to be a, a sensor based on what the, um, the ambient light conditions are. And so the, the sign can get brighter during the daytime when it's lighter, but at night when it's darker, the light has to get dimmer. Yeah, that so that sense. it basically yeah. stays the same yeah. like, yeah. brightness at all times. Yes, Council. And to follow up on your, the school was like an old-fashioned LED reader board. Yes. The current one today is like a TV monitor, a very bright TV monitor. LED. Well, see, yeah, you know, they can do yeah. animations, they can do pictures, they can do naked ladies. The credit union won't do that. Yeah. <laughs> Once the credit union gets one, they'll be four or five more applications. So that's what we got to keep in mind. Well, one thing we have to keep in mind is that, of course, whatever we do in this, we want to make sure that we don't allow anything offensive. Well, I'll allow. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Um, I like the idea of how you said the deep core this. I'm not sure if that's what where it shuts off at a certain time. Um, is that something we can talk about? Oh, yeah. That's an option that they yeah. Okay with. And I'll verify that with Porter for because I have this vague memory, and it's been a while since I've been through there at night, but I have this vague memory that it had something to do with their dark sky ordinance mm -hmm. because they have a dark sky light ordinance. Mm -hmm. And I want to say when they put the computer board in, they said, okay, you can have it, but it has to go off at a certain time. And, and realistically, after like 8 p.m., the people that are going to the credit union, why do they need a sign on anyway? Because the place is closed. Yeah, that's yeah. what I was thinking too. Yeah, they maybe and, and don't need it because any Because the nature of this would be an exception, or. you guys can accept whatever you want. Oh, okay. sure. Well, then, uh, unless there's anything the more on this, uh, administrator, just do what you set out to do and then. Yeah. We'll take a look at it next month, and the council got anything more that they want to say about it or do about it, and who can do it, and that's what we'll do. Sound good to everybody? Yes. All righty. And that's a technical term, right, Mr. Mayor? What's that, man? Technical term? Who do? Who do? Yeah. Sorry, I forgot. We are live on video. I don't remember that. <laughs> that's so, okay. Not right live now. on video, but we're being recorded, so I, I'm sorry. The, I, time, yeah. the day that you can have a little bit of fun, yeah. then we're crying out loud. You know? And at the end, it is 8 o'clock. I was going to call for a little bit of a recess, but uh, I don't know. Uh, administrator, well, no, let's go ahead and make sure that we get the um, 9, the uh, resolution, R1819-09, fiscal year 1920, the CTR rates. Uh, Council, do you have anything that... Uh, and in your supplemental packets that I left there, the um, the, uh, the rate schedule, I didn't have that at the time that the oh. um, packets went out, so a copy of that is there. And that would be what is um, attached to the resolution if adopted. And um, do you have it there, Councilor Kaufman? I saw it. Okay. And basically, it's just the breakdown of what the, what the current rate is and then what the proposed rate will be. And he also included um, including the 375 for the recycle card. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Are we ready for the black or any on this? No, we really we have. I don't think we are because no. we've had a lot of people talking about the recycle thing. We did talk about it last year. Brookings has had it. They said that it actually went over fairly well in Brookings. Um, I think most people want to recycle better. Is this something we're just trying to approve their cost of living increase that they want? No, no. This we're, is their, we're, it's this COLA and their rate structure right, for 2019. In short, it's a yearly, once again, it's a yearly thing that they come before us. The only thing new in this one was the uh, new way that they're going to be collecting, yeah, on uh, the cards. Councilor Ryan always voted against this. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Well, it's a matter of conscience with him, yeah. and that's fine. And so, this is a democracy. So you yes. bet it is. And you each and every one of you have your own mind that you vote the way you want to. So, with that in mind, do I have a motion to approve this resolution? Thank <laughs> you. 
or to commence the principal activity permitted by the conditional use permit. Um, normally, staff doesn't, um, I, I don't have like a magic tickler system to look at people's conditional use permits. However, um, we usually know, because usually when somebody gets a conditional use permit, they usually take care of whatever it is pretty quickly, you know, and, um, or if they don't, they're usually like have invested a significant amount of money and so then they will come back and ask for an extension, which that is possible to do. Um, the reason why this kind of rose to the top is that um, we actually have to shut the water off at this location um, and actually actually have to remove the water meter for non -payment. And that that's, doesn't happen for at least six months. So this was kind of a, so when staff notified me that we were at the removing water meter stage, I was like, okay, they had a conditional use permit, so they haven't opened their business yet? Because um, we had signed off on the building permit the summer before. So then when I went and looked, it's like, um, yeah, nothing had happened. So then I thought, okay, I better check and see what the expiration of that conditional use permit was. Um, and it would have expired on October 17th of 2018 because there was not an extension requested and substantial construction according to the code um, had not taken place. So staff meeting me, wrote them a letter and said, hey, your conditional use permit has expired, you need to reapply. Um, and so they had contacted me after receiving that letter and said, do we have any recourse? I mean, what do we do? And I'm like, well, um, I, I can take it to the council and ask them to review the decision that I made. Um, and you have the opportunity to um, try to convince you guys. But it has to be, the decision that's before you tonight is um, affirm the decision by the planning director that the permit expired or overturn the decision that the permit expired by the planning director. And whatever decision you decide to make, you need to tell me uh, what you're basing that decision on. And that has to be, um, it has to be something in the record. Like, okay, they applied for a building permit. Maybe they haven't finished the construction, but they did get issued a building permit by Great County. <coughs> so that's where we're at. So, uh, and I'm gonna, Ruin her name, so I'm just going to call her Rosa because I don't, I'm not going to be able to pronounce her last name correctly. Rosa did submit a letter on Monday, um, and she had actually come here for the hearing, um, but we had canceled the meeting, and I did not realize that she had driven down until she got here. Um, but she did submit something in writing, and um, I won't read it into the record, but you do have copies of it. Basically, the gist of it was that after the permit had been expired. Um, she was expecting, there was complications, um, she had a very long-term illness, um, and that is what caused the permit to expire. So I will go ahead and get her on the phone now, and if you have any questions for her or me, um, then we'll go from there. So, <coughs> and actually, so is everybody clear about the kind of decision that we have to make tonight? Do you have any questions before I get her on the phone? Are we making a decision with her on the phone? Um, you will because she. this would be like if she were here present. Yeah. Okay. But do you have any questions? I, I do, but I think you should ask it when, okay. she's, on when she's on the phone. Okay.
I did have one question in particular, and that was why there was no communication with the uh, administrator during that entire year, and also that the uh, water was turned off, the water meter, I think, was uh, taken out, and we had not heard anything from you for quite some time until just very recently. So, would you mind yeah, explaining so a little bit of that? Most definitely. Well, <clears throat> so through this entire year, obviously, as you know, provided with a letter, uh, you know, what was really traumatic, um, like an interest in my last year. And what I went through is very traumatic, and for me, even now, to have to have, you know, even explain that was very difficult. And I think that there's Are you still there? Yeah. Rosa, are you um are you mobile because you're cutting in and out? I I am uh, um can you pull over? Uh, no, I am I am in or do you um, Jody? Yes. Would you like to call my landline? That might work a little bit better, okay? Um, okay. Text me the number, don't say it out loud because we're recording, so just text it to me, okay? Okay, no problem. Bye. Okay, all right, bye-bye.
for it, and I didn't want to have to give an excuse to Jody or to the water department on, you know, I felt like, you know, what I went through is my personal life, and I didn't want to say, well, you know, I'm sick, so I can't, which now, obviously, starting over, it's a learning experience for myself to have addressed. There wasn't no disrespect. It was just it was life-threatening thing that was going on in my life. Yeah. No, that's that's understandable. It's, it's not that. I'm just thinking that uh, you know, with within all of that, what you've done then is you haven't put us in a difficult position, but but nevertheless, it is something that just a matter of a few minutes. No, I, I agree, Mayor. I agree 100%. Obviously, I'm dedicated. You know, I drove to every meeting that we had from Portland to Roseburg, and it was just, it was, I can't explain to you what I went through or what was in my head other than making sure that I would live to see my daughter grow up. Under, oh, okay, I understand, Rosa. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Counselor, go ahead. So, not asking personally, but professionally, I'm concerned that there were several water bills that went out in between the time that the permit was issued and then um, the meter was actually considered um, being in service. So, I'm, I'm I, I would I would assume or I would hope that there was business support in place so that the structure wasn't disabled if one person was rendered uh, physically capable of representing the company. Well, I so I've always dealt with you know our businesses and all that in our you know in our personal life and have dealt with that. And, I've never expected to have experienced what I experienced that from, you know, being new to business, you know, we've been operating our company for only four years and it has been a learning experience for myself to have created a company um, out of nothing from, you know, Aaron and myself to employees to 150 in four years. It has definitely been a learning experience and since then we have, you know, accounts payable and, you know, more people in position because I guess when, when you're, you know, going through life and you live a life the way that we live our life where it's like we're growing and expanding, there's things that come up that you realize like this is a department, this is, you know, something that, you know, if something anything happens to me, things need to be function. I guess I never... You don't think that you're going to be in, in the positions, in these kind of positions, and there is no excuse for it. All, all I can say is that we, I've addressed it, and, you know, obviously I learned from the experience of it being, you know, costing us $3,800 mistake, where it's like, wow, I don't know how that was overlooked. But moving forward, it's not going to be overlooked as hired more people and you know want to I feel like we've started on the wrong foot and there is no excuse other than you know doing things different moving forward okay thank you uh council council yes yes council call um I'll start with administrative first if that's okay um our Conditional use permits transferable? Yes. Okay. Um, they go. They actually go with the property, not with the person. They're issued to the property. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, Rosa. I have no idea how to say your last name, and I would normally call you by that. Um, this is Keller Coffin, oh. by the way. Um, and I, I wanted to, to say that I, I understand I'm also a, a, a business owner and how stressful things can get. And you've apparently grown really fast. And I looked it up pretty quick on the Secretary of State. You've got 35 names um, under the name Lamoda something. Yeah. So that, that's a lot to keep track of. Um, and at your age, that's amazing. So good for you. Thank you. Uh, I think.
think my challenge is that, that it was an extremely difficult hearing sessions. As you remember, there were a lot of neighbors very upset with us for approving this. Um, so now that it's expired to allow an exception, we're going to get a lot of heat for that. So I've got to come up with um, something I can defend if, if I were to um, overturn the planning director's decision. D does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, but I appreciate your, your honesty and, and, and communicating with us, and I apologize that the meeting got postponed until tonight. I heard that you've driven all the way down here in that horrible weather. Yes, and you know, I'm very dedicated, and I take my job and what I do very seriously, and I'm disappointed with myself, because I, I, you know, my heart is critic, but, you know, I just, I couldn't, I was not capable or had the state of mind um, to deal with my normal things in life, and like I said, it was really difficult, even, you know, I was trying to schedule a call of Jody, and I just, I it was hard for me to relive what I went through. Okay. And it's difficult for me to even think about it now. And, you know, I, I think, I thank God that I'm okay. And, you know, I want to be able to put it behind us and know that I, I take and I respect um, the city of Gold Beach and everybody. And, especially my company, and I want it to be a success, you know, I want to be an asset, I have a lot of dreams for bigger things, and, you know, we've been an asset to our industry, and, you know, we're taxpayers, we are, you know, an asset to our entire state, being, if not the largest licensing holder, one of the largest licensing holders, and companies that employ the most people and want to continue that and there's no I don't want to make an excuse for myself I just want to apologize for not um, being on top of this so my, my follow up question is are you prepared now to move forward if you have still had a valid permit yes yes everything has been um, uh, you know under control I have project manager since then, I have hired two land use attorneys. I have hired accounts payable. Um, you know, when you start a company, and it's hard to plan until you organically grow. You know, like like I told you, we grew our company to 150 people by ourselves organically. And you know, I didn't come with business background other than just hard work and dedication and. I, you know, I feel like I would, will be an asset to your community. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Council, do you have anything further? If not, then uh, I'm going to be able to say for me. Do we have any other presidents? I mean, I know we've never been asked to make this kind of decision in the last 10 years, but... Is there any precedent of extending a initial use permit? Um, yes, and I can't name one right off the top of my head, but okay, um, let's just say, okay, if you're leaning towards affirming, I mean, uh, overturning the, the decision that the permit expired, um, in order to cite to information, it's in order to cite to stuff in the record, I would say, um, they do have, they did apply for and were granted a building permit. To my knowledge, the construction hasn't started, but they do have a valid permit. The permit has not expired. Um, they did reinstate the water, so in, in the eyes of um, the utility department, um, they are now current and up to date because they paid the back fee and they also paid for reinstallation. Um, that was actually not a condition of a conditional use permit, but they have water and sewer service that is currently active. Um, I, I would just say that, yeah, they have, they have the permit to do the building, and so they, 
they have obtained that permit. On the flip side, um, as far as the regulatory permits to do the um, Uh, to let's see, and require all the permits required by governmental agencies to commence um, the principal activity. When I spoke to the OLCC, um, they it is not um, it is not Lamotta's fault that they do not currently have a permit because a moratorium was issued on uh, new licenses. Um, between the time that they had applied for their conditional use permit, which they could not apply for a permit with OLCC until they got a permit from us. But in that intervening time, OLCC has suspended issuance of new licensees in order to catch up with um, the backlog they have on enforcement action. So again, if you're gonna look to overturn the decision, I would cite to, they do have a valid permit that they kept active, and through no fault of their own, they have applied for a permit through OLCC, but it has not been issued, but not because they didn't apply for it. It's because of OLCC's inability to process permits. You have data on that? On what? On the building permit and the um, OLCC permit. Um, I can, if you give me just a sec, I can get it. Judy, I want to clarify with your comment regarding OLCC. We have been assigned to an investigator. So therefore, we have um, made that cut where they will license our retailer. Okay, so they so you made it through that regulatory loop? Yes. Okay. And we have begun construction there. Okay. When did you begin construction? The date. I have to look at the date. We obtained the permit, if I'm not mistaken, a couple weeks ago, but not prior to obtaining the building permit. Um, the permit was issued by the county on 9 25 of 2018, so that would have been prior to the expiration of the conditional use permit. And that permit is still valid. And those are uh, valid for how long? I'm not sure a year as well. Um, they're good for, uh, they're usually good for 180 days um, unless you've had an inspection and then they just, there's, that's how it used to be. Now I don't know how it still is. But when I talked to um, the building department, um, I didn't talk to them this month, but when I talked to them most recently, the permit was still active in their, um, in their system. Council? Again, you can understand me. Okay, so this was the information that I got from OLCC in January. It said, um, Lamoda Gold Beach is currently an applicant on hold. However, they are not on hold to us due to inactivity or compliance matters. They are on hold because new applications are now a lower priority for our investigative team the current application renewal changes for requests. So she was, the OLCC ladies were letting me know that they weren't like on it, on a hit list or whatever. I'd like to ask one more question, but before you answer it, Rosa, I'd like the administrator to tell me if it's an appropriate question. In case the right council, um, can you, what date was your baby born? February 6th. Of this year? Of 2018. Okay. I, I think I have enough information. Councilor Brown, what do you think of that? You don't mind me asking? Yeah. 
education, start, start from scratch. But for our little bird, 
um, he did, and we talked about that. You guys had pictures of that last month. Um, on Monday, Will and I, uh, Mr. Newdall and I, met with um, the county emergency management folks. FEMA and the people from OEM were down. We went over our, um, we had to submit in mid-March um, our preliminary damage estimates of, of what had been damaged. And that went into the counties overall for the declaration of a disaster. Um, that actually went really well. Um, we had put our preliminary damage in about the 120 range, thousand. Um, and they actually, after interviewing us, bumped it up to a little over 200,000, which I have never had that happen. And I actually told the gentleman from FEMA that wasn't sure that I trusted him, but you know, because never had them tell it. They usually tell us that no, we don't get to include that, but they actually included more stuff. So, um, so that went really well. So we're pleased with that. We may or may not get anything from FEMA. Um, it may just be that our damage contributions will help the county or other agencies, but you know, um, if we can get some, some recoup some of the money that we had spent on it, that would be great, but don't count your chickens. Um, one of the things that I wanted to report to the council is that um, during this storm event, we had um, 80,000 CFS in the road. Okay, typically when we have, um, you know, when we get over the 60,000, um, we have issues with turbidity. This year, we had zero issues with turbidity um, during this high water event, and as reported by the um, pilot, that's the, the highest rain level we've had since 2012, which, I mean, that's not historic, but, you know. Um, but this was due to the work that the Public Works Department did last summer when we brought the, the intake property and we, um, we corrected some of the drainage issues at the intake, so we had zero turbidity. We had summer levels of turbidity during the storm event, and that is like, that's like award winning. I mean, I want to call the state and tell them how awesome Will and his crew are. Um, May I ask a so yes. purchasing that property and changing the drainage off of that property changed our turbidity in our system? Yes. That's amazing. And Will said today, in fact, Will had said this afternoon, he said it that equates to thousands of dollars saved in treatment, electricity, and chemicals. Because normally, because um, our water is always, when it comes out of the tap, it's always clean. But if it comes into the plant dirty, we've got to do a lot of stuff to get it to the same drinking water level. Um, and so we didn't have to do any of that this year. And so we saved, I mean, seriously, thousands of dollars on chemicals this winter. And that was just to do, just because of the drainage work that Will and the did last year. So that already, it's already saved us money. So that's great. Um, we have been having horrific issues with transients at the park. Um, we were forced to close the west bathrooms because we are having all kinds of damage. It's not vandalism, it's damage. It's that they are ruining things in the bathroom building. Um, and so uh, we'll, um, after the second broken toilet um, within about a one month period, uh, Will had had it. So we have um, locked the west bathrooms and there are now, um, there's a handicap and a regular sand can down in there next to the shop where we have um, surveillance. Uh, uh, excuse me, ma'am. Um, when it will lock the uh, I want to say Monday. It's just this week. And we opened it for one day for a softball game, and that night is when the toilet um, was vandalized again. Well, not only that, what, what brought the toilet, what made me ask that question is that uh, right after that softball game, I got contacted by, uh, I can't remember who it was, but it was one of the citizens. But at any rate, he went into the bathroom and he had changed children with him as well. They were there to watch the game. And they actually saw a fellow um, get really excited when they, when they saw him. And he takes off running with a backpack and everything like that. Well, they find blood in the sink, blood on the floor. And he said the guy was using the needle. Well, too. So we've had that problem as well. There's all sorts of problems going on. And of course, he was very concerned. 
because quite frankly, and, and rightfully so, you know, you've got children there for crying out loud, and particularly more so during the summer. Uh, to have that type of activity there is not uh, a real good um, advertisement for the, for the park. Yeah, or and anyway. that's, that's why we walk about Yeah, but and then what do we do in, in this question? What do we do with these one? Is that operable yet? I don't think it is. We it? only have that open in the summertime. Okay. So it's, it's now. If we don't, are we planning to open the west one in the summer? That is something that um, Will wants to talk to the budget committee about. Okay. So yes, right sir. now we have no plans to. What about the pavilion? Is it being analyzed? Too? No. They get is into the bathroom because is they it sealed. Or no? Um. Well, we have had have, have people break in there before, but for whatever reason, the transients seem to like the restroom. And part of it is that they turn the, the, the um, hand dryers on. We actually have to unhook the electricity, the hand dryers, because they turn them on and you fill it. Yeah. Um, it's going to be fun. And then we had a lady call earlier um, this month, well, it would have been March, to complain because there was garbage everywhere. Well, what we have found, the police department has reported to us, is that the transients are dumping the garbage out of the garbage cans and taking the bags and using them for raincoats. So yes, there is garbage around, but it's not because we don't have receptacles, it's because they're being dumped out. And this is an issue that every community in America is facing right now. I don't have a solution, I don't have an answer. I'm just letting you know that the only thing that we can do right now to, to protect our um, infrastructure is to close it. And and it's not that the police department is not doing their job because they go down there, we roust them as soon as we see them, but it's like as soon as they drive away, I mean, it's you know, just. You know, it, it, it's, it's a difficult situation. And I'll tell you, I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit. When when we went to the show in San Francisco this year, when we, when we um, come back, um, that, that return trip back, um, my friend and I, they go together. We always stop at Ikea and Emeryville, which is just north of San Francisco. That's like a big thing. Well, in one year's time, in one year's time, the exit to get off in Emeryville, which is a, is a fairly affluent part of San Francisco area, literally covered. It was, it was I, I don't even want to say it, it was a camp, because it wasn't a camp. It, it was, there was just filth and debris and it was it was horrific in one year's time. And I was just I was flabbergasted. I almost pulled over to take a picture and I thought I don't know that I want to pull over to take a picture. But it just in one year's time the the the, the transient problem. And this was not it's not tents and stuff. I mean it was garbage and filth and I I was amazed. And so I guess, knock on wood, we don't have that level of problem here, but we certainly have had a higher level of transient problem in the last um, six months than we've had in the last 10 years. Um, so that's, it, it, it's an issue, and like I said, I don't know what the answer is. Now, one of the know. things that we have to do is to, of course, ensure as best as we can the safety of our people. And that's the, that's yeah. the main thing, especially at the park. Um, right. Not that I think there's a good place for it anywhere, but the park especially is like, you know, that's where our kids are. Um, we have to, and, and I'm not going to apologize for taking a really hard line on it. We have the zero tolerance policy. And that's what we should have. Um, and maintain it. Yes. So anyway, that's a big philosophical discussion that, you know, whatever. Um, okay, so the police stats are attached. Um, fire rescue raid, I am sure that you have probably all seen Chief Krieger driving around in that monstrous vehicle. Okay, that, folks, is the vehicle that we purchased a year ago. It arrived last week. Um, they're getting it all decked out with all of its gear and stuff. Um, and so they started it there. At next month, I believe, he'll have it all ready. He wants to give the council a tour of the new vehicle so you can see all of its tours, tricks, and all those amazing things that it does. Um, the, 
just I know that you guys know that the truck was purchased with our fire truck levy money. That's what it was intended. Its intended purpose was to was to do that. Um, so if you have any of your constituents saying, "Oh my God, how can the city afford that?" It's because of the generous tax levy that the citizens of Cold Beach covered. So that's that's the purpose of their truck. Um, yeah, that time it took three times. But, it, um, but anyway, so that rescue rig, um, that will replace our little like ambulance looking kind of thing, which is tired and old and needed to be replaced. But this one, um, obviously it's four wheel drive, because it's ginormous. Um, but it can get to places um, in the city and in the fire district who we have a contract with that, that other rescue rig just we simply couldn't take in which places that they can. So um, he will give us a tour hopefully next month with that vehicle. Um, visitor center report is attached. Um, Debbie, you know, she does a great job of saying what's going on down at the visitor center. There's a really nice story about the, the semi-annual solve cleanup, so take a chance to read that. Monthly stats through February are attached. Um, I reported last month that I was seeing a dip in the taxable rent and I was thinking that it could be related to the sale of Ireland's and Gold Beach Inn. I think that is probably the case. Um, I'll continue to monitor that. But the folks that have purchased that property, actually have an appointment with them next week because they're going to be coming in to talk about um, some redevelopment on that property. So that's kind of exciting. Um, again, I was gone down to the San Francisco uh, travel show. This year was different. We did a three booth regional booth with all of travel, southern Oregon coast. There's some a photo there of the folks that were in the booth with us. Um, it was, it was um, different but fun, and I'm glad that we did it that way because before in the past we've done just a Gold Beach booth. So it was really kind of, um, it was really kind of cool to do a regional thing, and um, I got to meet some folks that uh, I don't normally get to interact with, and so it was, it was a good thing. Uh, that, I think, is everything I have. And there's one thing that uh, I provide sometimes to you, the, the economic, Southwest Oregon economic indicators, I get that from the state. Um, the really great news is that, yeah, we are still one of the lowest and uh, un, un, one of the highest in unemployment, which is just not... I know, I know. Uh, but anyway, so I try to provide that info to you when I get it. So that's all I have to you. Thank you, ma'am. All right. Councilman Adams, do you have anything that you'd like to say? I think so. Councilman Brennan. Uh, no. Oh. Councilman? Councilman. Sorry, I got time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been thinking about um, the issue that comes up occasionally, and then I don't deal really with it, and it's the idea of um, limiting the number of vacation rentals in the city of the beach, and the idea of being to keep the housing stock for locals available. I don't think it would work, though, unless the county was willing to deal with us, and that would probably mean all three cities and the county. Um, and I say that because if we look at the number here, we're looking more across the river, or more south of town. Um, so I don't think it would be a fair um, thing to do unless we can do it. Um, is anybody opposed to me going to talk to the commissioner and seeing if the ARS didn't do that? Joint meeting with the other cities and starting that dialogue? No, no, no. Would anybody like to join me when I'm ready to go? <laughs> I think I'm going to start with just a quick dialogue and then try to set up a meeting. Do we still have? The four and the three Yeah, I did we have one yeah, a couple the, days ago. The, the, the M and M meeting. Well, the, yeah. the county the county leadership meetings. Oh, county leadership. Yeah, yeah. The leadership. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, it's it's kind of just an ad hoc thing that Commissioner Pash okay. and then um, yeah, that might not be a bad idea. There, there's supposed to be a quarterly. The next one's going to be in June, and we're actually. Um, There's plenty of time for it, right? Yeah. The, um, at the last one, the city, the can Julie asked if we would be willing to host it each month, each quarter, because we're centrally located, and they wanted it to be off campus from the county so that people would feel free to talk. 
a station or two for what they call pay program, public education government. And when the county upgraded their equipment several years ago, uh, we it was on the basis they would upgrade it and they would reinstate doing great coverage of their meetings at the county annex building. And once that went, they would look at maybe establishing their second station and putting it out for public. Well, it turned out technically that couldn't happen, so they gave us access for three days a week uh, for government and education. Uh, we have a work workshop coming up with them. Unfortunately, I just got word it's going to be the evening of the Second Amendment discussion, so for the second time in my life, I'm going to stand in front of a room full of people who are carrying something I'm not used to. But one of the things we're trying to do with Curry County Voices is to provide that local media. And if you look at the website, we're very proud of the 30-some programs we have on there. They run the range of the Poet Laureate of Oregon, singing and talking poetry to the Ready, Prep, Go that Rotary did that Jody was part of. Uh, we have a program that we just put on on Narcon, train people how to revive those who have had drug overdoses. Uh, and when the community building in Port Orford was, is now under review for major upgrade, and they had a meeting at City Hall to talk about the proposed design. Uh, we filmed that, and that's now on our channel three days a week for the next couple of weeks, so that the people in that community get to see it who simply couldn't be there that afternoon. And that's what we hope to do for, for you and for others in the county, that's to provide a, a vehicle for that your shows can, your meetings can be seen by those people who simply can't be here. There are a lot of our citizens that don't drive at night because of vision. And, uh, so we, we yeah, appreciate the opportunity to do this for you. Did I hear you earlier say that this was available on YouTube? Or well, we, our system is, uh, our deal with the county is uh, they want to protect their interest in their channel. So we're required to engage their consultant to put our stuff on the channel. And the system they use is a YouTube system. And the benefit to us is that it also gives us the ability to put it on a website. And you know, one of the big concerns nationwide is that cable is slowly dying. And it's also it's part of it's because the younger people don't rely upon wires to bring them television. It's part of it that the federal government is changing the rules as to how they have to calculate what they pay you. You may find that your franchise fee uh, at the end of this year is going to drop substantially because the FCC has now ruled that they can count against your 5% fee indirect benefits they give to you. And we're part of an organization that's we're gathering both of our federal senators have been opposed to that for us. Most of the opposition is coming from New England and California, and hopefully more from Oregon. But you know, you may find find yourself having to give up your channel before you have an opportunity to use it because they're going to say to you, "Well, that's worth all we pay you in your general fee, so we don't owe you anything more," and your check stop. And that's one of our main concerns. And we're discussing that, and we'll be discussing that on the 24th with the commissioners, but, uh, but this, you know, doing this is why we're here, and uh, we started in 2015, and we're still, still alive and kicking, we've overcome some major hurdles, uh, we have 17 people trained to do what I'm doing, we have 35 programs already online, next week we'll be doing the League of Women Voters Special District elections, we'll have the tax Town Hall. The week after that, we'll be doing the chamber meetings on the TLT. Uh, whether that 
really meets what the some people, the annex probably think we should be doing, is questionable that that's what we think we should be doing. That's what I believe we should be doing, and that's what we hope to continue doing. And uh, if we get enough programming done, we could probably help you satisfy the requirements to activate your channel so that those people in Gold Beach who have cable through your franchise would be able to turn on the TV and see it. So, but thank you for the opportunity to do this. Well, yeah, and thank you. Truly really appreciate it. Truly really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. And just for um, Mr. King said it takes about, it'll take us about like five to seven days after they do the editing and stuff. And so what we'll do on our .dev page is we'll just link back to them so that way, like, you, they can watch it on public access TV, but it'll be on their YouTube channel. And so we'll just put a link on our page so that people can go to our page and then it'll go to them. Anyone in the world will be able to watch your meeting and think of that. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Thanks, Carl. Thank you. Uh, I want to continue on. Um, begin with, uh, I miss a man. I uh, well, in Avery, he was the, as I said in the game, but he's going to be very tough to replace, as far as I'm concerned. Um, yesterday, I uh, was in North Bend for the Oregon Coastal Trail meeting. Uh, it is really encouraging. They are moving along pretty good. And as it stands right now, what they're doing, they decided that they didn't want to use the word gaps because it sounded as if they were missing a lot of things. So, so now they want to say, as soon as we provide the connection. Okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> so at any rate, their connections should be uh, right now, through May, they are going to be working on uh, Zone 8, no, Zone 6 and 7, I believe. And that is the Coos Bay area up to Bannon and around that. Now, they promised me in June that they would start working on our trails and doing the connection with those as well, too. The amount of money that is spent by tourists on these trips, on these treks, almost like the Appalachian thing, that in essence that's the idea that that's the model that they're shooting for. And um, so at any rate, when they get here, uh, I and Dave Lacey will be uh, handling the program, or at least handling the meeting and what have you, and that type of thing, you know, for the coordination. What I understand. I didn't know that. All I knew is that they asked me if I wanted to do something. And, and you said yes. The, well, there was all that pressure. Everybody's looking at me saying, <laughs> and smiling. There's horrible smiles when they want you to do something. But at any rate. But you so, know what you have the power to do? Proclamation. I could delegate. have gotten them all out of there. Yeah, <laughs> you can delegate. Well, no, I said that. I told I told them Mark that, who was ahead of this thing. I told him, listen, you know, I can delegate. He says, no, you can't on this one. We're not going to let you do that on this one. We need we need your presence there and all that type of thing. And I thought, oh, crap. Well, anyway, you, you don't have to do it now. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, I am, uh, I, w I was really happy to see what's going on and what it can mean to our community. Um, but also I was saddened in that all the cities from Reedsport to Brookings, each one of them is going to be impacted by this, okay? The only two cities represented were Reedsport and Gold Beach. That was it. And they were disappointed in that. In the fact, they were happy we were there, but they were disappointed in the fact that uh, here, we're, we're working for you. We're trying, and, we're, and they're doing it in such a way that because each one of our cities are roughly about 20 to 25 miles, 27 miles apart, and many of them have natural barriers, so that you have to go through that city, like traverse our bridge to get here and then continue on. Um, so they have, uh, are trying to arrange it 
so that each stop basically coincides with the city. So to bring more people in and that type of thing. And so, and they found that, that a general hiker and what have you goes roughly about 20 to 25 miles a day. So it's just almost perfect. They work all of this. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm, uh, I wish we had more city involvement. I yeah. mean, not our city, but, but other cities. It might be a good opportunity. I'll, um, I have a, a regional meeting up in Bandon um, on the 23rd. Uh -huh. I will bring it up at that meeting, and maybe it would be an opportunity for um, our regional group to maybe represent. Because I think probably, like, especially for, like, say, Port Hartford, it might be a capacity issue. It could be just that they don't. Um, they don't have somebody available. They so maybe the, the, the region group, and Dave is, Dave Lacey is kind of plugged into that. So yeah. I'll, I'll bring that up at the meeting and say, you know, can we help facilitate having some uh, presence for those cities that aren't represented? Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Uh, the other thing, too, if you guys don't mind, I think I just might write the editor of our paper, contact him somehow and let him know that uh, we would appreciate it, at least I would, and I hope the rest of you would, uh, a little bit of coverage. Um, the, the gentleman from the pilot, um, he, I will say that if Boyd isn't able to be here, he will often ask me to send him a copy of the audio so at least he can listen to it. And then now that Curry, Curry County Voices is doing that, that will, um, yeah. that will help. But, I will say that the pilot will at least, they usually contact well, me. Well, you know, I, I was going to get to that, that the, the fact that the neighboring city's paper does a much better job of covering us than what our paper does. Which, you know, of course, our paper doesn't do any job. If I may put it that bluntly, and I think I will. So, with that in mind, that's enough that I've got to say. So, and there are no citizens, I'm not counting the two of you, or you, uh, to make any comments at this time. So, the next regularly scheduled city council meeting is uh, Monday, May 13th, uh, at 6.30 right here. And the council will meet as a budget committee on Wednesday, April 17th, and that's something else I, I forgot. I did let the administrator know I won't be here for that. Uh, I have uh, a board meeting to attend to in Coos Bay at the very same time at that time. And since I'm not really all that instrumental in the budget committee meeting, I figured you guys do just fine without me. <laughs> so at any rate, with that, uh, yes, ma'am. I have an urban renewal reading.
13th. I don't think it will take real long, so we can meet at 6 on May 13th if you want to. And then I can have Rebecca on the phone. So we're leaving the sixth meeting. And Unless you guys want to meet without me, I can make arrangements to have um, Rebecca on the phone. That's, so it's up to you. It looks like we don't want to leave without you. Okay. Yeah, I'd rather do that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That we're going to do our team hour and we're done for 15 minutes and people can find them. Okay. So it's really so weird. We have executive session and people stand outside. Yeah. Okay. And I'm sorry, I don't normally, I usually, it's just, I had this opportunity to, to go on this trip with my son and I don't get that opportunity very often. Um, and I'm going to make sure you take it. You like yeah. All right. That's, that's what I'm is saying. Everybody, is everybody quite finished? Yes. Good. I am too. <laughs> Okay.